Hello, everybody, and a warm welcome on a Sunday morning to the participants for this 3AI Leadership Roundtable series. We are going to be talking today about strategic priorities as we go into 2024 for AI and GAI. I was just reflecting with the panel earlier this week was how much has changed in the last a year with the, with the advent of GAI. So this is going to be an exciting 2024 and 2025 as we move forward. I've got a really great panel of folks today, and I'll make a quick introduction to them. They'll get a chance to speak more about their profile when they present their priorities. First, we have Nanda from RR Donnelly. She's the global operations leader. We have Vijoy from Cognizant, who's senior director, global IT and AI head. We have Shri Mui from Philips, who's the COE head for customer experience. We have Rahul from Jubilee Foodworks, who's SVP and head of analytics. We have Pankaj from HS HSBC, who's head of credit analysis for Unit Offshore. And this is going to be our panel for today. Now, as we think about the structure for the priorities for 2024, we have categorized this into a framework so that we can capture the universe and also kind of make sense of it. So at the highest level, there is a demand side requirement for use cases, and then and there is the supply side of it. On the demand side, high level, when we think about it, there is revenue generation oriented use cases. And what are those? Some examples are intelligent applications or tools that power AI or AI and GI power tools to drive innovation on the front office for their clients or hyper personalization at the last mile to improve the customer experience. The flip side of revenue generation is risk mitigation. So pre-production risk mitigation around trust and security or in-production mitigation around exposure and vulnerability assessment. And lastly, a very important bucket is this whole cost and productivity optimization. Examples are planning optimization or using co-pilots for code generation, internal automation, those kind of initiatives. Now, the demand side has to be supported from the supply side. Right? So an important element of meeting demands, whether those are external client demands or internal demands from business units is the ability to build that compute infrastructure, which is the first piece. Talent across the ladder and across skill sets is also very critical. And more and more important, where there's so much of possibilities of what can be done, governance becomes very critical. So business strategy should be made, should we buy some hybrid that hybrid thereof, privacy, ethics, leaderboard or private prioritization, all of these become very great. Okay. That's the structure in which we're going to have the speakers uh, present their use cases. Every speaker will be going for about two use cases in about 10 minutes. And then we'll uh, finally regroup for some of the Uber trends that we expect to see into 2024 as a collaborative discussion. I hope you hope you derive a lot coming out of the session. Thank you, Vijay. You can take over. Thanks, Aditya. So good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us on a Sunday morning and giving us your valuable time. Like Aditya said, uh, we have a very eclectic set of speakers from a wide range of industries, right from say communications to banking, uh, to B2C, from the food sector, and then from the manufacturing side. So what we're going to do over the next um, 50 odd minutes is uh, have each of the speakers quickly talk about what their role is, what they do in the, what their company does, and what are some of the key priorities that they see um, as part of their 2024 strategy that they're doing in the space of AI and analytics. So I'll kick started off with uh, requesting Nanda, uh, who's from RR Donnelly, to briefly talk about her role, her company, and her priorities. Thanks, Vijay. Uh, I'm Nanda Chintaluri, and I work for RR Donnelly, which is a communications company, but I'm in the outsourcing division. I had the research and analytics uh, teams here and uh, we work with a wide range of customers uh, on the outsourcing uh, as outsourcing service providers and uh, I take care of uh, 
uh, analytics as well as research. So I'll speak a little more about, you know, how we are applying AI and analytics on the research side and uh, multiple industries. But I'll talk a couple of uh, use cases where, you know, how we are making changes. Uh, one is starting very simply with uh, doing research itself. The way we were doing research was completely manual. We had uh, judgment driven. I mean, we always were very proud of the fact that, you know, we have people who can track every industry and give very specialized insights on industries. Now, that's not really going away that the human input uh, on that. But what is happening is that you can make it far more efficient and turn around things much faster. So a typical research report would probably take 12, 14 hours to turn around. Today, we can uh, completely automate certain sections of it, at, at least. So uh, what the way we are doing it is creating a self-service portal where uh, a customer can log in, type in what they want in their natural language. The AI understands this creates the report, looks for existing content, which is there, builds it all together, creates all those charts from the data, which is available, formats the whole thing, puts it all together, and then sends it to the actual researcher who's supposed to work on it so that the analyst can then pick it up from there, see if it's actually re re meeting the customer's requirement and uh, add their insights uh, personalized uh, insights on top of it and turn it around. So what happens is what would take days to go uh, will now go in hours or minutes also at times. Sometimes it can just be, you know, half an hour that you can turn it around. Sometimes there will be a little more than that if you realize that the AI has really not covered everything uh, uh, or is repeating some stuff here and there. You need to edit it a bit and clean it up. So that's a uh, uh, simple kind of uh, application. Uh, the more complex application could be you know, of something similar where you are doing it for, say, patent research. Now, in fact, we thought, you know, the legal industry is so regulated that this is one place where we'll find it very difficult to kind of uh, convince our customers to look at these solutions. But surprisingly, I mean, the kind of uh, response we are seeing from them is quite uh, encouraging, you know. Here we are talking of uh, patent research where you uh, use uh, multimodal models where uh, the research can uh, be, you know, where you're looking for, say, filing a new patent. There is huge amount of work there typically, and uh, the law firms like charge a ton there by the hour, by the minute they charge you. And uh, this requires going into, uh, you know, looking at historic patent data, historic and current industry research where what is happening in the various journals about that particular industry to go through all the internet archives, go through all the case laws, the dockets, uh, academic research that is going on. You need to kind of really look at multiple things to be able to figure out whether somebody is already working on this patent, if somebody will dispute your patent when you apply for it, things like that. So uh, what happens here is, again, you know, we this is one of the use cases we're working on where you need to really pre-train them or pre-train the model to go through tons and tons of all this research, look for the right places for the right thing, and then come up with something where a human will actually look through it. And so these are all... Uh, end of the day, human in the loop or expert in the loop kind of solutions. It's uh, where the intelligence of the person cannot be uh, undermined, but at the same time, it just makes you so much more efficient there. Um, another uh, research uh, related stuff, again, similar thing is push intelligence, where you are, you know, proactively pushing information to somebody to take actions. Uh, so. Uh, say a CPG industry is something that we are working on. We have customers there where uh, you can uh, 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 say these people are visiting stores every week. So there is the performance of the store. There is the performance of your products. There is the performance of your competitors' products. And then the performance of these neighboring stores in the area and uh, intelligence on any events that are happening there in that locality. Uh, how do, uh, then external demographic information. Now, if you push all this intelligence to the 
salesman who is going there there are some who will go through it there are others who will not understand it there are uh, different people doing different things but can you actually provide actionable insights to them uh, whereby you know they can actually go to the store and say you know these are the products i want to push today uh, so uh, giving research is one thing but giving them actionable insights is the other thing which really adds value so these are some of the use cases here uh, the other thing is that we being in the communications industry we work with a lot of retail customers we've created a, a workbench for the retail industry where there are more than 100 models that we have uh, pre-trained and put it on the model that helps in uh, making your campaign more efficient by you know uh, looking at data as it comes analyzing it and giving you actionable insights on what needs to be done there and how can you cross sell how can you penetrate more and uh, get better outcomes there and that's kind of uh, really helped our customers uh, with the existing workbench itself we are getting like millions of dollars of additional revenue for customers and that's something we really want to focus on this year to make it far more robust make it end to end where everything is in one place your entire analytics on performance plus all the intelligence <coughs> Thanks, Nanda. That was very insightful. So, we could you share some specific examples of where, given the lot of hype around uh, today around GAI, hmm. what is happening in your industry and what are some of the use cases that you are looking at potentially in 2024? So, GAI again uh, will be something that uh, we're looking at uh, right now. See, there are also a lot of security concerns and all that to openly utilize it. So the way we are looking at it is uh, looking at certain use cases for uh, say sentiment analysis kind of a thing you have uh, 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 information that uh, comes in in the form of uh, uh, say customer service you know information using that and uh, getting to know uh, what is the customer sentiment there and how do you uh, then proceed from there so that's one of uh, the things but uh, uh, simply for us, you know, research report writing is the simplest thing there, where you uh, uh, can make it so much more easier when you use uh, that to uh, improve your language, how you frame stuff and how you make sure that uh, we have these, uh, you know, editors that you sitting there and uh, editing the language, the grammar and all that. Now, all that can be completely automated uh, using the GAI. Okay. Nanda, I had a quick question for you. Mm. And I'm pretty sure audiences are thinking about this. So when you when you work in a space like legal where every every word needs needs to mean something, mm. how do you control for one when you're looking at case studies and patterns, you know, how do you prevent you know it's a hallucination? There was this fantastic and somewhat humorous case where a whole case law got prepared and somebody presented it and all the case yeah that was being represented that was just hallucination. So how do you how do you handle what are your compensating controls? How does that work? For you? So as I said, you know, none of these are completely automated. There has to be an expert in the loop, somebody who manually checks to make sure that it is a valid uh, case law that it is being is being picked up. And second thing is we are not using the open uh, model so it's all on prem or it is in a private client where you are feeding the data from genuine history so what where you're training the models is also important you're not training it on uh, you know whatever is available out there in the world uh, it web but uh, based on uh, what you are using as genuine uh, data for training the models so that's one part of it and we are definitely not doing away with people checking every single thing and uh, validating it before it uh, goes out to a customer yeah and, and there's an a broad comment i think this whole context of in context learning at the point of where you are asking let's say gi to give an outcome is actually very critical both in terms of relevancy of that and also how long does it take to give answers right in your case it that might not be so important, but in other cases which are real time or quasi real time, this becomes very critical. So good. That's 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 really good. No, but see, we are only trying to build efficiency from where a human would do it to using these as tools to aid us, right? 
so it's not like you are saying that i instantly just pick it up and give an outcome and start uh, applying the next second so just sort of quick follow up question uh, you know with uh, the impact of generative ai what's the challenges that you see in 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 the workforce because you spoke about research writing and then what kind of talent do you have within your organization to either skill them up skill or cross skill so that they continue to remain um, relevant and uh, add value for the organization anything that you can throw light there so i think continuous upskilling is something that nobody can uh, uh, you know be uh, say that it's uh, uh, something that you can just say that i am doing this and this is my specialization i'll keep doing this for the rest of my life uh, you will need to keep specializing further you will need to add value that your uh, machine cannot give so uh, you will need to go deeper and you will need to go broader as well so in our organization we really have this learning academy where we are training people training people to use these tools better and more importantly instead of thinking that this is going to throw me out of my job you help me understand how this can help you do your job better so we really reward that so we have these idea contests ideations happening all the time when citizen automation is great so if you are a person who doesn't come with any technical knowledge but you come with a deep domain knowledge then how do you understand the tools that are available and how do you come up and tell us these could be use cases can you help us create a solution here and we really award uh, reward that a lot so that people actually feel encouraged to use these things feel encouraged to uh, uh, apply these things and come with solutions and then upskilling people even technically is something that we do we have that training academy which continuously keeps uh, encouraging people so you if you become efficient you can use some of your time in learning rather than you know 14 hours of work every day then you are actually more efficient and adding value to yourself is how we market it with people thanks nanda appreciate those uh, very insightful conversation so thank you so we'll we'll switch to our next pa- panelist on here so to you, over to you shri moy shri is from philips so if you can talk about what you're doing there and what your priorities are You're on mute, Shimoy. Can you hear me now? Yes. Great. Good morning, everyone. And uh, as Vijay rightly said, thank you for giving us your valuable time on a Sunday morning. And a big hello to my fellow panelists. Um, so I uh, have been um, mostly an analytics professional for about seventeen years now, and uh, currently I'm working in Philips. Um, as a brand, I don't think that needs uh, any introduction. um when we think of uh, ai or gen ai use cases uh, i think uh, there are multiple areas that we are focusing in um focusing in uh, 2024 and uh, i would just talk about a few of them because of course there's a plethora of those that we want to go after and uh, we'll see how much of that we can do um the one that i want to start with is um so we have uh, i i think most of these uh, most of global uh, organizations uh, have audio calls right so you have these call centers where people call in and log in their issues every product company has that so uh, we have these audio calls that are getting recorded and then they are just lying there because uh, nobody has uh, the time to uh, go through uh, you know each and every one of these calls because it's a, it's a time consuming thing let's be honest and uh, how ai or gen ai helps us uh, to unlock this uh, treasure trove of information is uh, by the speech to text that's now available uh, through ai so what it does is basically takes this uh, recordings and uh, converts them into text files and then you can do traditional text analytics uh, and now i don't i don't think it's traditional anymore it's significantly evolved so um, it it helps to um you know look at your whole operations in a very different way you have a faster ability to see if there are certain concerns that are getting um boosted due to certain issues in the supply chain so there are various ways you, that you can do the root cause analysis now um and because text analytics is so evolved you can very well understand what is the 
generic sentiment, uh, in some cases specific as well, uh, of your customers towards, uh, you know, when there are issues or when there are uh, requests for services and things like that. So it lets you look at the, uh, you know, at the small problem from various ways. You can optimize your call center operations as well. So it's, it's a, a wonderful way to, um, as I said, unlocking a very new, um, you know, source of data, which I think most of us have, but most of us have not used. Um, the second one that I want to uh, talk about is, uh, so how often has it happened that there is the beginning of the month and you're going through a QBR, a quarterly business review or a monthly business review, whichever it might be. And there has been a question from your exco or very senior uh, leadership team uh, to say that, you know, we need this answer in the next, uh, you know, half a day or sometimes within an hour. And uh, you are a team of 20 and everybody's trying to get to that answer, but it's very difficult. So that's the problem that we want to solve. And one good way to solve it is that everybody has uh, different mother databases, right? It could be, for your case, it could be SFDC, it could be SAP. Uh, there are multiple of these that are plugged into your uh, uh, infrastructure. And what you want to do there is uh, create an LLM-based solution that's interactive, similar to ChatGPT, if I can draw a, a parallel. Um, and uh, then what it helps you do is it helps your querying become very interactive so um, and, and give you uh, as uh, easy solutions, not, not solutions, but gives you at least the kind of information that you need. And that information bridges the uh, gap between, you know, confusion and decision making. So uh, that's the end state that we are uh, going for. And let's see, you know, how much of that uh, confusion to uh, decision making we can uh, bridge in the next year. Uh, it, it is a significant improvement, uh, as you can already uh, see, over any static KPI reporting, because static KPI reporting, I'm not saying that it will replace it, but yes, it will add that color to it that, okay, if this uh, score stands at this place today, you know, what is it that we need to do to nudge that? Or what is it that is driving this core in this, but to behave in this fashion? And uh, are there certain areas in our operations, in our supply chain, in our sales that that is actually driving the scores in a certain way? So it gives you all kinds of um, ability to deep dive into uh, the, the behavior of your KPIs. And also, um, you know, it, it it gives you the ability to generate insights on the fly. So I think that that's the beauty of that solution. And uh, uh, we are very excited about uh, being able to implement it. And then the third one that I wanted to talk about is something that I think almost everybody is doing is to see how we can, we have all seen chatbots into the play for the past uh, five, six years now, right? Maybe more. Um, now the point is to see how more intelligent they can be um, and how more dynamic they can be. So there are plenty of use cases of, uh, uh, you know, where uh, the responses are hard coded from the chatbots that um, I think we have we all used like Swiggy chatbots or Zomato chatbots right in our daily lives. And uh, they after a point in time, you can figure out that they are they, they cannot help you. So can we push that boundary a little more and see if they can still help you uh, answer some of these uh, through, uh, you know, using generative AI and uh, trying to see if there are uh, better ways to improve our chatbots. So th these are some of the interesting cases that I wanted to speak about today. Great. Uh, Shiva, we had a couple of questions mm -hmm. for you. So one, big element of using GAI and making consumer focused devices more intelligent is mm -hmm. the very act of putting an LLM into a small device, which is <laughs> not yet proven. And supposedly I was reading this somewhere, this is going to be the holy grail for Apple. Once Apple's able to miniaturize an LLM to the point where it's within the device, you know, we can all think about the art of possible there. So from your vantage of Philips, where, how do you see that happening? And is there, are there, uh, initiatives in the organization which are focused around how do you embed LLMs into devices to enable better consumer experience? 
Uh, that's that's a great question and something that we are regularly brainstorming on. Uh, it's still we are still some way off from there, uh, still to get there, I would say. Um, and and uh, that uh, brings us to that uh, very contentious topic nowadays about responsible AI, right? Um, yeah. The intelligence is artificial, but the responsibility is wholly ours. So uh, I think uh, here we have to be very conscious of uh, what we are embedding and uh, how we are doing it. And uh, one classic way of doing that uh, that we have heard so far is through enterprise licenses, which means that you bring the whole thing into your own protected uh, environment, and then you, uh, you know, let that uh, solution interact with your data because data is the new oil, right? So, uh, and and there is uh, so much security that we want to, uh, uh, you know, give it. A and there's so much uh, confidential information that we have to protect, right? Each of us in our own organization. So I think the responsibility is uh, lies heavily on us on how we are doing this. And which is why, uh, while we are all very excited about AI and Gen AI, I think uh, we need to approach this very cautiously and take our time to ensure that we are not throwing things out there just in the hurry of uh, being the front runners or being having the first movers advantage, whichever way you call it. Um, so I think, uh, as, as I said initially, you know, using AI is very exciting, but how to implement it is the challenge that I think all of us are facing right now. And each of us have different ways of doing this. Enterprise license is one of the ways that, uh, you know, we have uh, approached or we have adopted to uh, keep it safe uh, within ourselves. So, uh, Shrimaya, you are the um, COE lead for the you know, voice of your customer. Yes. And so if you can talk about what are your customers asking you from a generative AI standpoint or AI or analytics capabilities? Are they ready for it? Are they ask, expecting more? Do they believe the technology will be a game changer in, in the experience that they will have? What are some of the insights you're gathering from your customers? Uh, that's a great question. And as you rightly said, I lead the voice of customer COE within Philips. Uh, so I mostly deal with my internal customers, which are all the businesses and the markets and functions uh, within Philips. So I do not uh, talk to external customers or deal with external customers on a daily basis. Um, so what I think that my internal customers are asking me is, of course, for speed for accuracy because um, you know these are two uh, things that they need uh, first and foremost um, as far as uh, what i could see from the kind of verbatims we gather and uh, customer feedback that we gather i don't think the customers are as such asking for uh, ai or gen ai applications immediately uh, and and these are the retail customers that i'm sp speaking of however on the b2b side where there are large equipments that uh, philips builds of course there is a significant use case that we have for ai and gen ai and those are the cases where uh, while the customers are not exactly saying that you know can you uh, or they they don't have that technical uh, ability to uh, ask for it but i think the whole um the whole uh, point is that if there is no adoption of this we will lag behind when it comes to the speed of uh, you know implementing uh, newer technologies or newer equipments or improving the older ones that we have and that will that way we uh, risk losing the competitive advantage that we have. So I think it's an um, implicit ask, not an explicit one at this point, but it's definitely very much there. Thanks, Shurumai. That was really insightful and helpful for us to understand right. how Philips is leveraging and what are the priorities that you're having in the AI and analytics space. So over to the next speaker. Uh, I'm sure all of us have had you know, a lifetime an opportunity to have food at Domino's or order from Domino's or had Dunkin' Donuts if you have traveled abroad, or had food at Popeye's. Uh, so over to you, Rahul. Uh, good morning, everyone, my fellow panelists and everybody who joined. Uh, pleasure to be here. Uh, so <clears throat> I am part of the uh, executive management at uh, Jubilant Foodworks, and I had uh, Andy Dixon Insight. 
working across uh, all the wonderful brands uh, which I was talking about, uh, Domino's, uh, Popeyes, Dunkin, Hong's Kitchen, that's Asian cuisine. So uh, I, I hope you had a chance to uh, test our food and hope, hopefully it lived up to your expectations. So uh, in terms of um, uh, Andredix and Jubilant Food Works, our, our vision is to enable our customers, our employees and our machines to make better decisions using data. And uh, that is why what we are sort of uh, striving towards uh, building a data platform that uh, that's real time, uh, gets all data in one place, uh, building data science capabilities, uh, solving custom business problems and democratizing data uh, in the hands of the user really. Uh, <clears throat> I'll talk about a couple of priorities uh, that uh, that's where we are uh, We'll be leveraging AI uh, or are leveraging AI and we'll continue to sort of push the boundaries. So um, not sure how many of you know, but uh, Domino's app is one of the highest rated app in the uh, uh, in the foods and uh, drinks category. We get about uh, 10 million plus uh, active users uh, every month. So highly loved app and a uh, lot of the experience on the app is uh, powered with, uh, with personalization. Uh, idea is that how do we make um, engaging with the app very, very smooth and how do we sort of uh, try and bring in uh, as much of the ordering experience uh, from a physical world to the to the, uh, the digital world. So as an example, when you go to a new restaurant and you, you typically ask what's special today, right? And uh, that's one way to sort of think about what does that really mean for me uh, when I'm trying to order online. And uh, if, you, if you go to our app, you'll see some of the recommendations come up at the top. Uh, bestseller, they are very, very personalized to where you're ordering from and uh, who you really are. So that's one way to sort of leveraging AI to say, I think, hey, we know what you may like and what this location is likely to serve the best. Uh, the other examples are when you open up our any of the food categories, be it a veg pizza or the sites in you know, non-veg pizza really, uh, the sequence in which you will see the pizza coming up, that essentially is very, very personalized to what you are likely to order and uh, your test preferences. So uh, that one-to-one -one unique personalization is where we have, uh, you know, we are uh, able to get customer to order very easily. And there's a tons of work to be done, you know, um, really, really uh, creating entire experience uh, 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 on the on our app, right from what do we communicate to customer, how customers can navigate, and how easily they can uh, uh, place an order and track the order. Uh, and this is one area that will continue to use AI to uh, uh, to push the boundaries and uh, making that uh, seamless personalized experience on the app. Uh, you, you'll also know uh, Domino's is known for a 30 minute uh, delivery guarantee. We started that about 20 years back. And this year we announced that we'll be delivering pizza in 20 minutes in Bangalore. So the first Domino's market all over the world to do that. Uh, a lot happens behind the scene to make it happen. Uh, right from getting our inventories right to our staffing right. Uh, because for me to deliver order in 20 minutes, there is a, obviously a baking time that uh, that happens with the only company, one of the few companies who stretch pizza by the hands. So all of those are, you know, pretty much non-negotiable. So all that's left really is to be able to accurately predict how long it takes to deliver and then making sure having a rider available at that point to uh, deliver the pizza. So uh, obviously there's a lot of work happens across all of this, but I'll at least talk about this part. So uh, one of the areas in which we'll be leveraging uh, AI is to continue to get better estimation of the demand. And for us, uh, that demand estimation uh, goes as low as being able to estimate every store, every channel, every half an hour level. That's the only way to make sure that I have enough enough staffing available. My my uh, kitchen queues are optimal, really. And then I'm able to uh, fulfill the promise. Uh, and I can relate to it, you know, especially when my uh, son's friends are home and they're waiting for pizza. There is there's no way for me to, uh, you know, uh, see a delayed order. So uh, we, we understand that and we work very hard to make sure that we are able to serve the happiness through uh, through the food we, we bake. So those are areas in which we'll hopefully uh, continue to uh, bring in productivity, bring in better customer experience and obviously through the first part, uh, better engagement and hopefully then uh, longer term uh, customer value as such. So uh, those are areas which are more customer facing really and then uh, I'll also talk about uh, some of the Gen AI areas that we've started to look at. And obviously, we are still early in the stages, really. But my vision is to uh, really create a analytical bot. We all know that how hard it is to find analytical talent. And uh, most of the projects are pretty much due yesterday. 
So, uh, and Shiva was talking about it, you know, that uh, there could be a query that people want to have quick answers on. So my vision is that uh, Gen AI essentially will, uh, will be able to do all of the MIS activities and 80% of the day-to-day uh, -day analytical pieces. Nobody needs to actually come to analytical team to answer those uh, simple questions like what happened yesterday? Where is the opportunity? What drew Mike's uh, growth? What was the, uh, you know, uh, what did not really work very well for me really? So all these simple questions actually can be answered through a analytical bot. So if I, if I fast forward future and if you're successful really, we'll actually have a personalized analytical bot for everyone in the company. And then a lot of the individual work can be, can be automated. Obviously we're far away from that, uh, but that's definitely one area in which we are trying to leverage Gen AI. The other application, uh, which you know, I think, uh, again, I think uh, where Gen AI will have a natural uh, interaction is going to be on the uh, uh, customer interactions. So, uh, and uh, how do we really make our chatbots more personal, more engaging and uh, solving most of the problems? I think the, the, the litmus test is going to be that people prefer chatbot over calling an agent because the resolution is fast. You don't have to wait in the, in the queuing line really. And that's going to be area where hopefully we'll push the uh, Gen AI. I think Nanda was talking about using Gen AI for, for the legal part and we work with N number of vendors, right? From uh, vendor for uh, getting a paper napkins in the in the store to uh, uh, technology vendors to uh, all kinds of vendor really. So how do we really look at all of the RFPs, all of the past documents and uh, use that to uh, create a smart purchase assistant, which will help have a meaningful conversations for our purchase teams. Those are areas in which we are uh, trying to uh, build in our uh, GNI capabilities to uh, bring in productivity for the organization. Great. Now that I, I'm going to put you on the spot with the question. So Shri Mori gets up in the morning, you know, Sunday morning, she reads her favorite paper and she has a particular brand of croissant she wants to order. And she's exhibited that behavior, not all the time, but more often than not. So do you see a scenario where especially again with the chat as your interface being able to push using gai and knowing the context being able to push for certain recommendations you say yes i want that particular cross on and the whole order goes through without the mechanics of the steps being done by her directly do you see that kind of customer experience hyper personalization happening sooner than later with the gi because offers and all sorts of journeys no, absolutely. I think, in fact, we do have a working capabilities uh, which can enable voice-based or uh, text-based ordering. I think um, uh, there's the challenge there has been more of a consumer adoption than a technology piece, really. Uh, but I think, yeah, it's it's not very far. I mean, I think it's something you know we can uh, potentially get on uh, fairly quickly. Um, the context part is getting built already in the recommendations we serve in session recommendations. So. Uh, uh, we haven't yet integrated something like weather data, for example, uh, but a lot of the other context on whether it is a Sunday evening or whether it is a Monday afternoon, some of that part gets anyways uh, built in into our uh, our contextual recommendations. But yeah, I think uh, to your question, uh, technology-wise, I think uh, the journey is faster. Uh, consumer adoption uh, potentially uh, hasn't happened that much. I think people still want to uh, explore uh, uh, I, food is very sensory, right? I mean, I think uh, we, the outside food need is uh, la hardly a pizza need. Uh, in US, for example, people eat pizza 35 times a year. For them, it's a very specific pizza need. In India, that's not the case, you know. I mean, I'm also ordering necessarily. I'm not necessarily only looking for pizza. I'm looking for outside food. So I still want to engage. I still want to. So the, uh, the consumer adoption will take slightly longer is my view. But technology is here. I think it's it's a very straightforward piece. Uh, we have a we have uh, working it uh, in house, and that's something we can easily make it available. I think uh, uh, so. Yeah, um, hoping, hoping. I think you know we can provide that convenience to customer and that indulgence to uh, uh, order in a in a uh, seamless manner. Yeah, and I think just one more thing. I I think we are going to go to a space. The power of GEI will enable the surprise element, right? So where ah that they. They understood, they see my pattern and they surprised me with something that was a customer delight on that particular day. Maybe a different brand of croissant than, than what she usually has. So that kind of thing. And I think GAI will enable some of that versus it being more structured uh, with what we see with personalized recommend agents today with AI. And I think that's the direction it, this thing will go in. The customer delight with a small amount of surprise is phenomenal. 
right? In that sense. In terms well, of I think spot on, and I think, uh, yeah. no, spot on, I think, and uh, hopefully uh, we'll be in a position to announce some of these uh, innovations and we'll be able to uh, uh, see them. So, uh, but yeah, I think, uh, but you, you think you're spot on. I think uh, some of the next envelope would be really, you know, being able to create that delight uh, uh, to customers. And uh, yeah, I think we're working on that. So. so Rahul, I had a follow-up question, right? Um, customer experience is important, you know, delighting them, like we spoke, uh, is, is critical. But for to enable that, much of it is, <coughs> especially in, in store, right? Your frontline staff has to be able to do that. So what kind of analytics and insights do you empower your frontline staff for them to take truly decisions that differentiates each user who comes and places an order in the store? Sure. So I think, yeah, so there are, there are two parts to it, really. I think one is uh, enabling the right information for store and the tools for them to uh, execute the customer experience. And the other part really is about uh, training because it's also area which has very, very high attrition. If you guys are aware about it, you know, I think uh, it's a very competitive industry, I think, you know, uh, and Domino's obviously is a, is a um, target uh, hiring, uh, you know, a spot for many companies. So, uh, so we do both. Uh, so uh, what essentially we do is when you go and walk up to a counter, uh, the person on the till will have, well, if you provide your mobile number and we have a history of that, you know, we'll, we'll actually enable uh, all of that information to have a meaningful conversations with the uh, with the consumer, uh, that's really one area in which uh, they can uh, have a live uh, interactions, which can get uh, influenced. Uh, besides that, uh, we've instituted something called as input-led reviews. This is uh, uh, making sure we look at the right input KPIs, which we can influence, and which has a meaningful impact on the outcomes, which could be your revenue, your cost, your customer experience. And same sort of framework is uh, embedded uh, as a review right from a store manager all the way up to a CEO. And all of this is enabled and happens uh, on, a, uh, on a weekly basis. So we know that uh, what is working, what's not really working, and we're able to uh, uh, highlight uh, early on where there are uh, issues, whether it is concern, whether it is uh, NPS, whether it is cost, and you know, then that way uh, we enable uh, store teams to sort of uh, take actions. The other examples are essentially uh, using uh, technology and the analytics to uh, help them make decisions. So we have an auto indenting tool. Every every day uh, uh, we we, have, we place an order for our inventory almost every day, really. So uh, that uh, automated engine actually tells you how much cheese you are likely to uh, need tomorrow, really. And obviously, the store manager has a uh, has a ability to overlay, knowing, for example. Uh, very, very localized event that they know can impact demand lower or higher. Uh, but pretty much in most cases, those recommendations are pretty much used as as is really. So that way, you know, we're, in, we're enabling uh, store managers to sort of focus on consumer more and then less on sort of uh, thinking about uh, how much do I really need. So, and we also building, we also actually have, a, and we continue to build that uh, app, which is, uh, which is fronting uh, our uh, store teams, which is one, one stop shop for them to, uh, uh, interact uh, across all the functions, right from data to maintenance to uh, staffing to everything really. And all of that essentially is is a way in which we can uh, influence the the last uh, person standing on the ground. Thanks, Rahul. Hopefully, at the end of this uh, panel discussion, we'll all get a Domino's pizza delivered. Absolutely, uh, always a pleasure to do that. Really, uh, definitely uh, look look into that. Okay. Okay, over to our next speaker um, from the banking industry. This is an industry, the fintech has always been at the forefront of technology, be it from an adoption or leveraging whatever is the greatest and latest. So over to Pankaj for us to give us a deep insight into what's happening in the banking space. Thank you, Vijay, and I hope I'm audible. Um, so uh, one, I think it was really nice hearing to all the three panelists before me. Uh, you've got a view of the FMCG industry, bit of an industrial and then a services legal sort of a view. Uh, I'll probably talk about, um, in some sense, what's what's happening in the financial services fintech space um, and how it's kind of evolving, how AI is shaping that up, uh, covering a set of broad-based uh, use cases. So I think there are a couple of themes I want to cover. Uh, first of all, the concept of... Uh, open banking. <clears throat> it's something that we've seen over the last couple of years. Uh, essentially, what open banking means is the ability to <clears throat> for banks and financial institutions, what core, 
uh, opening up APIs for a lot of fintechs to sit on top of it and, and do their play. Um, uh, right now, I think as a region, Europe uh, leads that that pack. But I think this is a space which is going to continually evolve um, in the next few years. Um, bulk of the places that you would have seen, for example, it happens in account aggregation, uh, things like personal finance management, doing some instant credit risk profiling. Um, uh, for example, India, Beam is a classic example. A couple of Indian startups, likes of Cred, Paytm and, and the Bits, which are uh, using, which are sitting up on top of an open banking infrastructure. Um, and so I think that heavily dependent on the use of AI uh, data analytics, uh, because it is trying to aggregate and then build, build analytical engines, aggregate multiple accounts for, let's say, an end customer. And they're trying to aggregate um, uh, their financial services. bit. So I think that's one space you will see a lot more action uh, through the use of AI um, and Gen AI. Um, the second part, and obviously the first one is personal finance. You heard people talk about hyper-personalization. So I think that's financial services view of, of hyper-personalization, uh, which is trying to run looking at a consumer from multiple accounts, mul multiple credit cards, their loan loans and things like that, and getting all of it together uh, running a few analytical engines to grow their businesses, grow their revenues, or manage their risks better. Uh, so the second area that you that's that's a lot of action happening is embedded finance. Um, essentially, embedded finance is is a place where a non-financial company uh, is providing uh, in their entire process, providing a, a financial process as as part of the entire customer experience. Um, I think this is, again, an area that you will see a lot of action happening. Uh, good examples are, let's say, an e-commerce company providing insurance. Uh, you see a lot of that happening through Amazon. Uh, a Starbucks as a coffee shop giving the option of one-click payments, even though the infrastructure is sitting outside. Uh, some bit of um, co-branded credit cards through a, a store or airline is something that you've seen. Uh, but I think the idea is to embedded finance, merge financial processes so that the friction is the lowest. Uh, but in that process, when you remove the friction, you get a chance for the consumer to stick with you and then start taking a lot of financial services or financial products. Um, PayPal, which essentially was a payments company, it is, uh, I think, about more than 70% of their revenues now come from uh, from fintech. It is probably the largest non-banking lender uh, in the US. Um, I think that's uh, that speaks volumes of where it started in the, the context of creating an embedded finance solution, but uh, moving uh, upwards and generating a lot of revenue. The second area is in this space is the concept of buy now, pay later is something that you would have heard of it like a year and a half back, it was just 120, 130 billion dollar company, but growing uh, exponentially more than 80 percent. In the next five years, expected to grow further. Um, specifically in India or countries which has a strong demographic dividend, uh, where you have native technology users, uh, it is something that will grow. And I think India will also be a case in point. Um, so heavily consumer focused, even as as I said, the demographic dividend oriented. Uh, if you're just providing financial services without the use of this embedded experience, I think you should be worried. Uh, a lot of banks across the world are moving into it. And again, if you see this as a concept, this is only possible with the use of AI. So again, the concept of um, running your processes more, integrating them more smoothly, which has a tech element, but then eventually understanding the consumer needs, going back to the personalization element. Um, is, is something that uh, is based on AI. Um, the third part, again, uh, the concept of neo banks, uh, which is essentially digital only banks. Again, strong, high demographic dividend places, people who are very comfortable managing their finances digitally. Um, neo banks, extremely heavily dependent on the use of AI and technology. Um, and I think. Uh, 
it is not it won't be surprising i think there's some estimates it is almost going to be a trillion dollar um, market uh, in the next maybe seven to eight and ten years um china in the us is essentially sixth or seventh largest in terms of uh, primary accounts and they were just started what 10 years 11 years back uh, and and these are they're just behind the likes of jp morgan city bank which have been in existence for very very long i think this again uh, is happening because of the use of ai and these are places which will continue uh, to grow and evolve um, and it's only possible because of the use of uh, of ai uh, so we've talked about three concepts uh, open banking embedded finance uh, and neo banking but there's another very interesting piece which is extremely strongly dependent on companies which are predominantly tech slash ai companies uh, the big tech uh, getting very very close the big tech giants which are now getting very very close uh, to providing services to their customers essentially started off with the payments uh, but if you see the likes of apple continuously adding digital banking services uh, and i think all of that is happening because of a very strong foundational AI and data background. So, um, for example, Apple says it believes uh, the 2 billion phones will be 2 billion bank branches for them. And if you just take the Domino's example that Rahul was talking about, imagine uh, a bank app owned by 2 billion customers interacting, doing financial transactions, and you have access to so much uh, rich information. Uh, and all that is it re is required is you can service to this large population through the use of uh, AI, Gen AI, as you see. Um, Apple, I mean, essentially started their journey in 2013. Apple Pay in 2013 built a cash thing on 2017, 19. They had their card business, BNPL in 21, uh, started savings accounts last year. Um, and again, in this case, um, Though it is standing on a very high, strong foundation of AI and analytics, but the one big reason is, remember in a financial services or a bank, one of the reasons you bank with them is uh, privacy and security. And I think that's the place where a company like Apple has a very strong advantage. You see people, Google Pay, Samsung, everyone is trying to get into that space. Um, so I think 2024 and beyond, that's another area which will emerge um, strongly. Now, if you see all of these, the, the, the importance or the relevance or dependence on technology is increasing, which also means the concept of regulatory secure scrutiny, the uh, eventual safety of it, compliance, um, ethical uh, bits that somebody talked about will also increase. So I think that the use of AI in the space of regulatory tech will also become uh, extremely important. Um, fifth, I think from a very tech services vendors orientation angle, I think uh, I have seen a lot of now technology vendors using products which are based on the foundation of a, a Gen AI. Uh, essentially, what they are doing is they are trying to uh, use Gen AI as the backend, put some UI on top of it, and they are selling solutions around that to end customers, the customers who may not be so strong in understanding of the capabilities of Gen AI. Uh, so that's a space where a lot of vendors and contractors are utilizing um, to kind of build system and then sell them as solutions. Uh, so I think that area is, is becoming very, very interesting. Um, the, if I were to know, this is what is already happening in the space. If I have to take like 2024 and beyond some very drastic technological AI innovations, then there are a few things that are happening. <clears throat> um, I, I don't know if you guys have heard of something called a, a company that launched Human AI Pin, which is nothing but an AI uh, device, uh, which you can st stick onto your chest and it will dis the displays on your hand and things like that. So that's something which is the idea is you want AI technologies to become screenless, seamless, and very sensing. And I think that's uh, that's really, really futuristic tech. Uh, how far it succeeds is, is the jury is still out. So let's wait and watch how it kind of progresses. Um, and the last thing in this, this space of AI, um, 
it is something that right now is very catchy. Uh, there have been some reports, uh, the likes of Microsoft, for example, have commissioned and they've seen the return on investment on their uh, on AI investments. So they talk about some good numbers, uh, something like uh, a dollar invested gets you three and a half dollars back and things like that, a small proportion, even larger than that. But I think that uh, right now there's a lot of hype. I won't say the word hype, but a lot of interest why people want to do it. But at some point, and as it becomes embedded in our ways of working, people will start wanting to have a much stronger background of building a, a strong return on investment case for it. Um, it just is a very nice thing to do. But internally, when you look at your systems and processes, you would uh, want to see whether you're trying to kind of kill a fly with an AK-47. Is that even required? So uh, right at some level, that maturity and sensibility in, in our assessment uh, will come in. Um, and I think that's it has happened across all the like how when technology came in and things like that. And I think some, something similar will happen in this space as well. I think that's that's my view of 2024 and beyond strategic priorities using AI. Very cool, Pankaj. Pankaj, I've got one observation, one question for you. Observation is around when we think about digital banks, the, the need to have it run at scale to be profitable is very critical. So, you know, in the recent, what, last week, we've all seen the machinizations between Apple and Goldman in the Marcus example, right? And essentially, you know, top tier T1, <clears throat> you know, GSIB bank like Goldman did struggle with scale, scaling that business and the economics, the per unit economics for the consumer, right? So I think while there have been some good uh, good initial successes for digital banks we're also seeing one too many banks you know being opportunistic in this area even including traditional banks opening up their digital counterparts etc but scale is very critical here to be successful so that story is still to be fruition second the question was i see and i wanted to get your perspective on it from a large bank perspective the friction between permission data and personalization right so with with the regs coming a lot of regulations coming out right now around seeking consent explicit consent before data is contributed india might not be that far ahead so far uh we being more permissive and from that perspective but a lot of the developed markets of europe and us are getting very strict about permissioning of data and I think that is going to have some kind of a chill factor on really, really innovative use cases, you know, in the areas of mass personal financial management, as an example, right? uh, where if I don't have certain information that goes beyond your banking footprint, it's going to be hard for me to give you relevant products, right? And you might not give me permission to access that data. And I, so that's, I wanted to get your perspective on that. Yeah. Um, on the first part, I think it's a, uh, you mentioned a great point. And so one of, if you see in the end, why you are in the, in the business is if you're making money. So if you see the, the concept of hyper personalization through digital natives in financial services um, uh, is very easy. Your bulk of your larger revenue profit generating customers are in, in the higher demographics. So one reason it becomes, and they are not as strong as, as the natives, right? Uh, a lot of those guys would still want a personalized relationship. Uh, banker would want to visit branches and things like that. So I think it's at some space in between, but people have to stay invested in the long run because once the natives become get to a place where they become very profitable customers, um, that's the time. So it's a little bit of a timing issue, I think, and companies have to stay invested in this space. So I think that's the first part. Second, I think, uh, yes, uh, data privacy, especially in financial services, is very important. And that, that is one of the reasons why a lo lot of banks have not pushed the um, uh, push themselves to move into this new, new banking space. Um, the biggest uh, uh, contributing variable in this space would be uh, use of ethics and um, how much trust people have in your system. 
uh, once that is established, um, this will open up, this will become better. Uh, but yes, it will always be a challenge. I think, in my opinion, if you ask me, large banks will hold on till they see that that uh, curve, the, the movement of the curve between a good balance. And that's when probably some acquisitions, large acquisitions will happen. And they will just probably yep. take up that scale. Great. Vijay, do you want to wrap up this section? Maybe we get we get a few minutes to kind of open up the panel for a round table, last piece of it. Yeah, sure. Th thanks, um, Pankaj. I think uh, it was really insightful for us to hear about what's happening and then what is futuristic that we are expecting to see, you know, the open banking space, um, be it new banks or embedded financial. See, most of us, I'm sure, have salary account in X bank, a credit card expenses on a Y bank and all our mutual funds with another uh, different uh, bank or, a, you know, NBFC. So combining all of those to be able to give true insights to a customer on their spending patterns and investment patterns and then recommend what should be the way they should look forward in order to generate the right set of revenue or savings that they have to do to generate the return from those investments so i think the future is there and we just need to see how we can leverage technology and open banking should be able to enable that with banks opening up their core platforms for others to be able to collaborate and take it forward yeah. In fact, oh. sorry, just one thing to add, Vijoy, is mm. the uh, goes back to Adit, Adit's question as well. So if you are able, so eventually you have to get to a space where you're building analytical engines, may not necessarily holding data. Um, like if you see what WhatsApp has done, right, recently, they say your data is encrypted. I'm not even reading it. I'm not storing it and things like that. So that has built that trust. And if at some space you build those analytical engines, but give that confidence of trust that your data is not being misused or not even being stored. I think that could be one place where people will be comfortable with it. Yeah, right. that's a great thought. I, I think that that makes sense because people have to trust, right? That their data is because financial data is very sensitive. They want to be sure that nobody is going to be able to hack and see how much they earn and all that. So, which is essential for them to build that trust and then use that solution to be able to make the decisions around it. True. So thanks um, all the panelists for all your insightful um, thoughts on what the priorities are in your industries, in your organizations. Uh, this was really helpful. So I'll hand it over to Aditya to talk about a little more about the regulations that are starting to crop up you know, across various governments um, across the world. Yeah. And I know we will we have four or five minutes to go at it. I think we'll pick two topics and one is around the regs which is a global phenomenon. And the second one is something that Raul was very passionate about, about planning. Uh, and so we'll pick those two as the two topics. So let's go on the next first. So a lot of you folks would have seen, there was an article in New York Times just last night or yesterday, uh, which just talked about how the European Parliament has now approved this AI Act. And Europe has always been ahead in a lot of ways in this area. So what was a draft about a year back has now officially been voted in. And there are, there are lots of details still not understood, right? So when you grapple with regs for AI slash GI, the one, the one element of this is that people are, are the, the, the lawmakers are grappling with, lawmakers and technologists, and policy writers are grappling with is when there are so many techniques, so many scenarios, how do you handle these various levels right, of regulations? And how do you create common frameworks that can be applied? So while there are a strong, while there are a set of folks that are strong proponents of this, there are folks who are saying that if you're going to regulate the way I build, let's say the specific example, the way I build my GI, the build side, if you're going to regulate that process, your regulations are not going to be specific enough or the regulations are not going to be specific enough for me to really adhere to those uh, guidelines. And then there are a set of proponents on the other side who are saying, don't regulate the way I build it, regulate it from the outcome perspective. So if I, whatever I did, 
ended up, let's say, creating a bias for Nanda for a credit request, that's a problem. Find me for that. Then go back and root cause, right? So do you do you regulate the bill side or do you regulate the outcomes? Is a you know there are people on religion on this on both sides. So and and the U.S. has obviously come out with the executive order that the Biden administration just recently released. That will result into a series of committee meetings resulting into into some kind of a law. I think they won't be too far behind Europe. And then Latin America, Africa, Southeast Asia, India, China, China's implemented some controls are also following suit. So this is all happening in panel, right? So, so Rex is becoming very critical. And I just wanted to open it up to the panel quickly, see whether they had a perspective to offer, and then we'll move to Rahul to kind of wrap up on that. So Aditya, I think uh, this is what I was talking about when I spoke about the responsible AI part, um, because all eyes are on this. I mean, there is no two ways about it. So, um, and, and that does not mean that just because this is visible, we do something about it, but it's more about how conscientiously are you uh, using this whole framework and um, you know, I, I think the bigger challenge is what you mentioned is that the regulations are kind of blindsiding us in a bit, in a way, because uh, when we started out, like when we start out a project, you know, these regulations are not there. And now this comes in. So how do we, uh, you know, kind of still coexist uh, in a way? Guardrails are always welcome, um, whether it is your own firm's uh, guardrails or whether it is something that, uh, you know, like the larger, from a country perspective, from a market perspective, something comes in from a regulation perspective, then that's also a uh, welcome. And of course, something that we all have to live with. But at the end of the day, I think, uh, uh, you know, the, the point should not be that we move at a break uh, neck uh, speed and, uh, uh, you know, kind of push these things uh, to the side. They have to coexist and we have to find that uh, right way through. And uh, um, in, in a way, I think this, uh, I mean, not from a supply side, but I think this is going to be the biggest challenge in 2024, where we have the tools, we know how to work with it, but we do not, we are still figuring out on how that implementation uh, happens. And uh, Whoever does it the first time, I think, uh, will have that uh, first mover's advantage, of course. See, my view is a little different. Uh, you have about you know 110 billion estimated spend on AI in the coming year, 2024. And it's completely private parties doing it. So obviously, at present in society, there are major ethical concerns in terms of you know privacy and surveillance bias and discrimination and perhaps the most deepest of all is the philosophical question of the era the role of human judgment is ai going to play god is an extreme thing but the bias part of it you know will the marginalized be further marginalized because of how ai is going to further discriminate and decide uh, you know divide the society at large that is somewhere a big concern uh, and governments have to address it at some point or the other in some way or the other so whether you do it at the front end in terms of how you utilize it or whether you do the outcomes is a different way thing but end of the day uh, you know if these are not addressed then there will definitely be consequences sounds good great Rahul, I'm going to have you wrap up on, on value creation. Maybe spend a, just a few minutes and then we are at time. Right. No, sure. I think I'll, I'll wrap up in uh, two minutes. Uh, I think Jena um, uh, essentially, it's, it's taken everybody by fascination. It's one topic that gets discussed right from school buses to uh, board meetings. And I think it's very critical to uh, put in the right guardrails to make sure that we get the right investment support but also the right business outcomes and a uh, lot of these initiatives, you know, I, I keep talking about it. Uh, only 10% of complexity is actually the solution, the data science, the, the ML part of it really. 20% uh, is the uh, technology evolution, uh, which will essentially integrate this data or instrument this data and then we'll have ability to execute decision. And 70% of it really is the, is the process and the change management, which is uh, especially when people are supposed to make a decisions really so uh, having a right focus across all three making sure you're building a science that your machines can execute 
and you have a change management part wherein it gets adopted and actually gets uh, used uh, and then we are able to not just deliver on building capability but actually building the required financial or a, a business in part i think is critical and then um, uh, that's how typically uh, we would approach that having a cross functional pod from somebody who is responsible to generate the value to technology who is responsible to instrument the required data or uh, uh, serve the required recommendations all the way up to the uh, the uh, analytics which essentially is responsible for building capabilities and that goes hand in hand actually from concept of uh, any ai related work to actually creating a business impact i agree and i think at the highest yeah. level what you are just i'm actually paraphrasing what you just said but knowing the entire digital workflow well that's now now that is de facto and kind of saying how every element of that chain gets executed optimized and then the ai proportion uh, portion of that which is the intelligence piece that you bring in at the right time kind of knowing the trade offs and where do you put it and how do you maximize is you know somebody needs to look at that somebody needs to look at that entire value chain and optimize it across rather than look at it in silos and that's no a lot of the strategy consulting firms do a phenomenal job of that but in the change agents and organizations which are looking at you know, complex workflows which have been digitized with ai gi enabling this has to be done very thoughtfully so that it uh, brings you the benefit and you also manage risks including secure security and data breaches and all that stuff, right? all right excellent uh, i think we've had a great panel bijoy thanks for running the the section with you got some great insights from the panelists i think 2024 is going to be an exciting year it's going to have its challenges it's going to have its personalities and ups and downs <laughs> listening to elon musk is always very interesting in this context with all of these firms like you know x.ai and deep 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 mind and open ai so we've seen a lot of shenanigans that happened but in in a, in a way that is disruptive and i would say good and good effect effect. you guys want to mute you said and in, in a lot of way uh, constructive disruptive and constructive so i think 24 24 is going to be all in all exciting and thanks for everybody taking time on sunday morning to join in and i wish you all the best for 2024 uh, i think we'll have we'll have all of us will have a hands full going into 2024 with our uh, respective organizations that we implement such use cases. Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Cheers. Thank you.